Let us turn now to the New Testament and to the book of the Acts, chapter 17. The book of the Acts and chapter 17. And here we shall read about Paul at Athens. So it's Acts chapter 17 and reading from verse 15. <clears throat> Acts 17, reading at verse 15. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and receiving a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him, when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Others, some, he seemeth to be a set of forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him unto Erepagos, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is, for thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you, God that made the world and all things therein seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on the earth, to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he is not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we all are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art, and man's device, and the thing the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, but off he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. How be it certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And I'm sure that God will bless to us this passage from his word. For those who take the Bible seriously, Luke, the author of Acts, is regarded as a faithful and accurate historian. So the book of the Acts is the second volume of his history of the beginnings of Christianity. And Acts, the book of the Acts, charts the progress of the gospel through the missionary activities of Paul the Apostle. And here we find Paul not at the center of the political world, which is Rome at that time, but 
in the then, but in Athens, which was still regarded as the intellectual and cultural capital of the ancient world. And the importance of this passage is that Luke records, he records for us the content of Paul's address before the Areopagus. We read in verse 15, those who conducted Paul, notice, brought him as far as Athens, and he is there waiting for the arrival of Silas and Timothy. What this section shows to us, if we take it alongside the passage in Lista, in Acts chapter 14 and verse number 20, is how Paul, in both of these passages, engages with pagan popular religion. And here we find Paul, the Jew from Tarsus, in a city made famous by Socrates and by Plato and by Aristotle. And although its greatest days were past, Athens was still the intellectual and artistic capital of the world. It was also the capital of Greek mythology. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 we read, while Paul was waiting there in Athens, he was obviously exploring the city. And we read in verse 16 that his spirit was stirred or provoked within him, says another translation. And what provoked this? Well, it was the sight of the city, wholly given over to idolatry. In verse number 17, we read that Paul's first point of contact was with his own people, the Jews, and therefore the synagogue. And there he disputed with them. And secondly, in the marketplace. Athens, it was a cosmopolitan city. And there would be people from all over the ancient world who had come to Athens. In verse number 18, Luke identifies two groups of philosophers from two contrasting schools of thought. And here they intervene. And they want to hear more of what Paul has to say. Paul was disputing, we read, in the marketplace, the civic center of Athens. Luke records two things here, two observations about Paul. First of all, he is called by the people there in Athens, notice, a babbler. Secondly, a setter forth, notice, of strange gods. Now, what we need to appreciate here is that many of the cities in the ancient world were associated with specific gods. And we think of the prime example of this in Ephesus. You remember the cry, great is Diana of the Ephesians. Diana, the god Diana, was associated with that city. And that is why they say here, a set of, forth of strange gods that was not known to them. Notice what it says here, because he preached Jesus and the resurrection. And so here, Paul had a definite Christian content to his message, at least at this point. But they wanted, they wanted to hear more. And so they bring him to Erepagos. This was a more formal setting. This was a more formal setting. This is not like Speaker's Corner in London, oh no. This was more like a court where his views could be given a more rigorous hearing. Sometimes it is called Mars Hill. And here Paul is brought before this body to give a more formal account of what he believed, of what he was teaching. Now, before we look at what Paul says to them, we need to summarize very briefly, very briefly, the main salient points of these two different philosophical schools, the Stoics and the Epicureans. We could say of the, we could say of these, if we compared them, 
these two schools of thought, if we compare them to those religious teachers that we find in the Gospels, we could say that the Stoics, they were more like the Pharisees, and we could say that the Epicureans were more like the Sadducees. The Stoics were on the side of the ideal, of duty, of law, of virtue. And throughout the centuries, this kind of behavior has had an influence. You can defect this kind of morality even today. They believed, they believed in some kind of God, but the kind of God that they believed in was a God that permeated everything. It was pantheistic in nature. The world and God were somehow joined. There are some Greek green activists today who treat the world, who treat nature in this way. They treat it as almost sacred. Secondly, there were the Epicureans. Epicurus lived between 341 BC and 270 BC. The Epicureans, they were different. They were different. They still believed in some kind of God, but he was distant. He was a distant God. They rejected any supernatural influence in the world. They were more practical. Life was for living. Their life was directed toward happiness. And they could be identified today with modern-day materialists. Like the Sadducees, they did not believe in resurrection, nor in the survival of the human soul. Now, those in Athens, they loved to debate. They loved to hear new things. Look at verse 21. And verse 21 says that they spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. In other words, they were into speculative thinking. Into speculative thinking. Look at the beginning of verse 22. And here at the beginning of verse 22, we read here that Paul stood in the midst. And these words, they give us a sense of the occasion that Paul stands in the midst of them to declare what he has to say. And what does Paul say about them? Well, he says that they are too superstitious or religious. And here Paul starts with a point of contact. Here Paul starts with a point of contact. These people, they were not atheists. Not atheists in the modern, absolute, modern sense. They did believe, these people, in another realm. They did believe in recognizing this, because all over Athens, there were idols and there were temples. This audience, of course, it had no background in Judaism. They did worship. They were religious. And that was present all around in their idols, in their temples. But they did not worship the God of the Bible. They were idolatrous. And Paul begins with a point of contact, with a reference to an altar that he had seen whilst walking around Athens. And in verse number 23, Luke records for us what was recorded on or written on that altar. And Paul draws attention to it. It is an altar to an unknown God. This altar provided the perfect parable of pagan religion. In other words, this is a God they did not nor could not know. This is a God that they did not nor could not know, an unknown God. But Paul can talk here about a God that can be known. And the truth about him, the truth about him, can be articulated. It can be embraced. It can be believed. And Paul ends 
in verse 23 by saying, him, notice, declare I unto you, him, singular, personal, him, declare I unto you. To many people, to many modern people, with all sorts of different kinds of spirituality, they believe in some kind of God, perhaps shrouded in mystery, perhaps some kind of presence in the world, some kind of influence that we can encounter. But the God of the Bible can be known can be known because he has given himself to be known. He is the God who has spoken, the God who has revealed himself. He has spoken to us, disclosed himself to us supremely in the Lord Jesus. And when Paul says in verse 23, him declare I unto you, says in another translation, what therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. And although it is true that God is ineffable, and ultimately, ultimately, he is beyond words and beyond concepts as he in his himself, yet we can still know this God, not exhaustively, and we can make affirmations about this God, and that is important. But who this God is, is explained by God, by Paul here. Who this God is, is explained by Paul here in two ways. First of all, in his relationship to the world, in his relationship to the universe. Secondly, in his relationship to humankind. First of all, then, in his relationship to the world, to the universe. Look at verse number 24. God that made the world and all things therein. This world in which we live is not self-existing. Paul takes God as the creator, as his starting point here. He takes God as creator, as his starting point. And two things can be said about this God. First of all, this God is one. He is singular. And what Paul is saying here, secondly, is that this world was not created by a community of gods, a number of gods, a committee of gods. There is only one God who is the creator. We think of the first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And Paul makes the same claim at Lystra in Acts chapter 14 and verse 15. And here we see the lordship of God, the supremacy of God. He is the only God who is the creator God. Now, of course, this would not be totally unfamiliar to the Greeks. They believed in God or in gods. A God or God who was involved in bringing the, the world to be what it was. But notice these words, bringing the world to be what it was. But so many of them believe that the stuff of the universe, this world, has always existed. For example, Aristotle, the Greek philosopher, believed that the world was eternal. And how that God somehow shaped pre-existing material into the dimensions of this present world. In other words, they are saying that matter is eternal. They did not believe in creation out of nothing. And this, of course, this, of course, is the main point of contention with the so-called new atheists. They may be hooked on the Big Bang origins of the universe. But the question is, how did it come into existence? What caused this tremendous explosion? What caused it? And scientists can talk about the age of the world and talk about it in terms of billions of years. But that is not the answer as to why it exists. That is not an answer to why it exists. What caused it to come into existence? There was nothing, nothing but God. And then God in his graciousness and in his love brought into existence that which had previously not existed.
He spoke this world, this universe, into existence. And because he made it, Paul says here, he is the Lord of heaven and earth. And notice what Paul says, not only made the world, but everything in it. If we think of a house builder, a house builder builds a house for you perhaps, but he doesn't fill it with the furniture. And what Paul is saying here is, God not only made the universe, not only made the world, but everything in it as well. He created everything. What we need to appreciate is that God and the world are not identical. God and the world are not identical. And these words tell us two things. First of all, that matter, the stuff of the physical universe, is not eternal. And secondly, the world in which we live was not brought into existence by a chance collision of atoms, but rather that God made it. And it follows, therefore, that the God who made this vast, unmeasurable universe cannot be, he cannot be confined to anything made by man. He cannot be confined into man-made structures. Walls built by humans cannot contain, cannot confine this God. If you read, for example, Psalm 139, that wonderful psalm with its breathtaking, beautiful language, it speaks of the God who is there. Wherever we might go in the universe, he is there. He is there. Now, in this passage, Paul speaks about idols, and he speaks about temples. Idols, of course, are the products of people's imaginations. But temples are slightly different. You think, for example, of the temple at Jerusalem, and God's presence was there, but it was not confined there. He is perfect in every way, this God that Paul proclaims, affirms, in knowledge, in power, in majesty, but in love and grace. Rather, says Paul, the opposite is the case. Says the end of verse 25, notice, he giveth to all life and breath and all things. Life is not an independent principle. It comes, it comes to everyone. It comes to everything that lives. But it comes from everything that lives. It comes to everything that lives from one source, from God himself. From this one God, says Paul, there flows all that is. But the universe, the universe includes, the world includes us, includes us humans. And so Paul, secondly here, deals with this God's relationship to the human race. Look at verse 26. And now Paul turns from God's relationship to the world to God's relationship to human beings. He has made notice of one blood, all nations of men. Human beings are not the crowning apex of an evolutionary process. They are unique. They are made in the image of God by God. But if God is and is the creator of man, we see next his providence and his predestination. Not predestination here to salvation, but we see his providence and his predestination. For God, notice, has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. History of the human, history of the human race is not just a series of random events. He is the preserver. He is the orderer of all that he has made. He is not some local deity linked to only one people, one nation. Oh, no. This is the universal Lord. This is a very big God. The new RSV says at the beginning of verse 26, from one ancestor, he has made all nations. And that refers, presumably, of course, to Adam, to Adam. Now, of course, this is dismissed, has been dismissed for some time as rubbish. 
that the human race could have come from one set of ancestors, Adam and Eve. But recently, recently, computer modeling has shown that this is not impossible, that this is not impossible. And people, of course, that take the Bible seriously, believe in a literal Adam and Eve, our first parents. And God, notice, has allotted, has determined nations' existence, boundaries as to where they should live. And God has given every chance. He has given every chance to seek him. But obviously, this has not been the case. But having stressed, having stressed the transcendence of God, he now turns to the eminence of God, to his nearness. Notice what he says in verse 27. He is not far from every one of us. God, as God, is omnipresent, so that in him we live and move and have our being. But that does not mean that the world and God are one. And in verse 29, he shows that although God is universally near, he is not identified with the world. And that is why idolatry, the making of any material representation of God, is so, is so wrong. Now, up to this point, up to this point, there is much with which they might agree, these Greek philosophers. For many of them, there's nothing startling, nothing new here. But Paul now moves on to the ground of the gospel, and he moves from argument to challenge. It could be argued that up to this point in time, of, in Paul's argument, he has been using what is sometimes known as the historical, ethnological argument for the existence of God. And the argument is this, that in all peoples in the world, in all tribes, wherever they might be, in all their different forms, they have some form of religion. There is a general sense that this world is not all that there is. And Paul here is making this general appeal, this general appeal for the true God over against all these misguided ideas that exist in the world, all the misguided ideas that existed amongst the Athenian philosophers. But now Paul moves on to the ground of the gospel. For notice, the times of this misguided belief have come to an end. For God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day, he has appointed the judge. And the judge is the Lord Jesus, who has been raised from the dead. <clears throat> but here now there is a division amongst them. There are different reactions amongst those there, the Areopagus that day. Notice there were some that mocked. There were some that said to Paul, we'll hear you again on this matter. But there were others, notice, that believed. And amongst the believers, there is Dionysius, the Areopagite, one from this very court before which Paul had been arguing. Now, a question is raised here. A question is raised, he's, has been raised here, about Paul's approach. There is what is known with regard to this passage there is what is known as the failure theory. That is that taking this line of argument, Paul has departed from the main tenets of the gospel. And that when he went to Corinth, he determined not to know anything but Christ crucified. Now here we can say, as we draw this little study to a conclusion, we can say three things. First of all, Paul doesn't actually say, Paul doesn't actually say that he regretted his reproach, this approach. Secondly, there were people that were converted that day, and we would take that as a plus. Including, importantly, one of the Aero Pagite court that heard Paul's argument. 
And we would have been pleased by that result. There were people who were converted that day. And then thirdly, and finally, <clears throat> with regard to this argument, Alan Gamble once preached, once preached at, a, at a Christian lawyer's meeting. And present there that day was Lord Mackay of Clash Fern, who was, of course, the Lord Chancellor, who is a Christian, was present. And after Alan Gamble's address, the two of them had a discussion about this very question about Paul's approach that day to these Athenian philosophers. And both of them agreed that Paul's approach here was the right approach. Now, that doesn't settle the question, of course, and you don't need to accept that answer. But it's quite interesting that these two distinguished people regarded Paul's approach here as being acceptable within the context here of these Athenian philosophers who knew nothing about Judaism, nothing about the action of God in the Old Testament. And so here we have Paul. And he did preach about Jesus and the resurrection. And there were people that were converted that day. And what we can take from this passage is Paul's assertion there is a God, one God, who is the creator, who made us. And that one day there will be an accounting before this God. There will be a day of judgment. The day has been set and the judge has been appointed. And how do we stand with regard to that future occasion? Will our names, are our names in the book of life? Or will we be found wanting on that future day? Shall we pray? We do bless thee, O God, our Father, for thy word. We think of what it contains. We think of this address, so carefully recorded by Luke the historian, of Paul before these distinguished Athenian philosophers. And we think of the affirmative statements that he made, that thou art the creator of the world, the creator of us, thou art not far from every one of us, the God in whom we live and move and have our being. We pray that we might recognize this, and recognize a Savior has been provided, a way of salvation in the Lord Jesus. And that any who hear this message today might reflect and think upon these fundamental questions and fundamental issues of life, that God is creator, God made us, and we will one day have to give an account before our creator, and a Savior has been provided. We thank thee in the Lord Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>